Megan, we've just watched two episodes of Transparent, Man on the Land, which the second to last episode of season two, and Elijah, the first episode of season three. What struck me about both episodes, and perhaps others of you in the audience, uh, is the way in which they highlight, both visually and narratively, uh, Moira's utter disorientation and cultural shock in two Los Angeles lo locales. The Women's Musical Music Festival, here transposed from Michigan to the Los Angeles foothills, and South Central Los Angeles, where Moira, Moira attempts to find and rescue the trans woman Elijah, whom she spoke with on the, at, on, on the LGBT suicide hotline. Could you say more about the significance of the Los Angeles setting for the series in general, and the specific settings of these two episodes? What's at stake in Moira's alienation from the festival grounds as well as South Central? So there's a, a, you know, a ton to unpack, but um, maybe just starting with the different layers of her alienation and her um, sense of uh, despair um, in both um, settings. I mean, what's interesting to me about the Women's Music Festival is that the writer is um, working with sort of the micropolitics of the LGBT community and trying to think through um, how to present conflicting perspectives on uh, trans exclusion, essentially. Um, and so, you know, what better place to go than the hotbed of those kinds of questions, um, which was the Michigan Women's Music Festival. And um, so intertextually, there's a lot going on in that episode that is anchoring us very clearly within a broad set of queer debates. Um, so the presence of the poet um, modeled on Eileen Miles, uh, played by Cherry Jones, the um, 500 extras that they yeah. used for that um, sh week long shoot, um, and uh, trying to represent every conceivable body type, um, every you know, possible um, mode of gendered embodiment, and really trying to anchor uh, this story of Mora in uh, community with its own history. Um, and we see a little bit of her sense of privilege in that episode, but it's really brought home in the Eliza episode. Um, so her discomfort in South Central, her, un her inability to navigate spaces um, that are unfamiliar to her because of her class privilege, those come to the fore. Um, her assumption about the trans women whom she refers to as being on the streets, um, that whole um, you know, constant blundering through um, worlds that are uh, racialized, that are marked by class, that she doesn't understand um, because of her own privilege. So the, the series, from my perspective, starts to sort of chip away at those questions from as many different directions uh, as it can. And, um, we get a little bit in that exchange about um, her life as an academic in Man on the Land, um, about the privilege that she had, right, as a, a professor, um, and um, you know this. So every vector, um, every layer of her sort of social world um, comes under scrutiny. Yeah, and um, in these two episodes especially, it just seems that even the way that they're shot, it's very much about disorientation, absolutely. and from her point of view. Um, just to follow up, you have said that the world of the Pfeffermans is, is nearly completely white. Specifically, you have written, and I love this, quote, for all of the series' reliance on the topography and specificity of its Los Angeles setting, the viewer could be watching something set in the suburbs of Scandinavia, which on second thought probably aren't as white as this version of Los Angeles, <laughs> end quote. Uh, despite the series' whiteness, you nevertheless claim that it is a work of social ju justice as well as revolutionary television. Could you say more about those two, you know, revolutionary television and social justice, yeah. despite the overriding whiteness of, we were talking on the way into that it's, you know, we love transparent, it skews older, um, it's our generation, but please. Sure, so um, I guess to say something first about, about its whiteness, that uh, it's a complicated text because it's autobiographical. So Jill Soloway, the creator, director of the episodes you saw, writer um, and showrunner um, is writing a story about her father's transition and about her family. Um, so her sister is a consulting producer, as you saw, 
Um, she's working with um, material that uh, she's written from her um, experience, and that experience is, is really rooted in West Side, Los Angeles, Jewish, privileged culture. Um, and so she's, uh, you know, she's not to be blamed for, for uh, the origins of this really compelling story, but in rooting it there, um, I think she has missed the opportunity to think more broadly about her own privilege and her own um, view of the world and of the place that she lives. Um, so that sense of Los Angeles is very much um, you know, seen out from, from the interior of a nice Mercedes, mm -hmm. right? which is what Maura is driving um, from place to place or from the SUVs or from the you know, various um, cars that are, are moving throughout the world of, of Transparent and not from the bus that Eliza has taken to the clinic. Mm -hmm. um, or not from the streets that we see in Tangerine um, with the you know, beautiful Los Angeles um, sunshine mm -hmm. um, you know, gl glinting off uh, the windows of commercial places that you might pass by, right? So, um, so it's, that's how that world is shaped. Nonetheless, um, I think that there are two things to say about, uh, about what Jill Soloway has undertaken. One is that at the level both of representation and of personnel, she's created a trans production, employing as many trans and queer artists as she can um, incorporate, mm -hmm. and really giving a leg up to a lot of people who uh, were marginalized and whose voices weren't being heard by broad audiences, um, including uh, Ali Liebgott, who wrote the first episode, the Trans on the Land episode, and Silas Howard, who's uh, come on as a full-time director in season three, both people who have been mm -hmm. really prominent in queer cultural spaces for decades um, and who are finally you know, getting mm -hmm. an enormous um, boost in, and DGA membership, by the way, for Silas, um, which mm -hmm. is a big deal. Um, so, I love that you called it trans on the land. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so in that sense, I think it's really mm -hmm. um, significant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think the other piece to, to think about is um, the, the new platform. Um, so doing a series like this for Amazon, um, you know, the phenomenon of um, really new television that's created without the need for a pilot. Uh, you can write over the arc of... Um, a season thinking about character development and thinking about generating the story that you're telling um, really in very different um, terms in terms of production. So, uh, so in that way, I think it's also really significant. Mm -hmm. um, people have talked about this as, you know, the 800-page Jewish epic, um, <laughs> which, you know, it may turn out to be uh, if, it, if it continues. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, uh, Transparent, you, you say, is arguably the most Jewish show that's ever been on television since the early days of the Goldbergs, which ran on CBS from 1949 to 1956. So how are gender and Jewishness and queerness related vectors of identity? So Jill Soloway would tell you that what she learned as an undergraduate um, in Madison. women's studies classes at Madison um, is that uh, experience and identity are intersectional. And that's, um, you know, that, that lesson was clearly um, internalized by Jill Soloway. And um, so she understands that um, one can't think only about one vector of, mm -hmm. of social belonging. But I think the Jewishness is also, um, it's, it's interesting, it's become one of the, the most pronounced um, set of questions or the, the relationship between Jewishness and trans um, becomes one of the things that the series is trying to struggle with in thinking about its own understanding of the connection between identities. And it does that through the flashbacks that you saw to Weimar Germany, um, but it also is trying to think about uh, questions, really existential questions about being mm -hmm. um, through questions that are raised, you know, adjacent to Judaism. It's not about observant Jews. It, no. It's about a kind of secular um, and marginal relationship to Jewish well, identity. But well, in a sense, when in in the Elijah episode that begins, and because you've only seen these two uh, episodes. Um, you know, Rabbi Raquel at the beginning, you might wonder as she's 
herself trying, maybe you're your own Messiah. I mean, mm -hmm. this is, you know, that's kind of running through that whole, the, the question, the exactly. existential question. Right. Wandering um, the bamboo grove. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, maybe you could say for the group assembled here today a little bit more about the connection, the Weimar connection, and the, the, again, to just elaborate on, on the uh, Jewishness and trans identity and how it mm -hmm. plays out, um, the kind of tr traumatic memories and also, um, you know, the, the, the trauma is inherited. Yeah, that the, the series explores. It's a it's a weird. I, I don't think that I figured out entirely the logic that that Soloway is proposing here um, about that inheritance. But certainly, um, so through the flashbacks, we understand the origins of Mora's family, and we also understand in the presence of the character played by Hari Neff, um, the character who transitions into Giddle, mm -hmm. that um, that there's a history of trans in the Pfefferman clan, and that that history is speaking um, into the present. That's the sort of odd fusion between the Idlewild Festival and the flashbacks to um, Weimar make that sort of clear in terms of the persona of Ali and her conjuring of that past. But it's clear that the past is bleeding somehow into the present and also exerts some pressure on the present uh, in terms of how the series imagines um, acts of repression and violence against trans people. So the, um, those get sort of stitched together, but to my mind, not entirely mm -hmm. explained. So the, the flashbacks to Weimar are centered around Magnus Hirschfeld, and the sequence that we see here is Berlin in 1933, when the library of the Institute uh, for Sexual Science was burned. Um, and she's clearly proposing that Hirschfeld, who was Jewish, but not all sexual researchers were Jewish, right? Not even all German sexual <laughs> researchers were German or were Jewish, but, um, but certainly proposing here that, that there's some inheritance that comes um, to Jews um, of being responsible to marginalized people. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's some Jewish history of sexual uh, liberation mm -hmm. and of a version of life that if, is affirming uh, of trans It was just people. a weird juxtaposition. I mean, I've seen this episode a, a few times, yes. but, and trying to, you'd have to watch more of it to see all the references past, present, as they, because here you might, if this is your first encounter, you might not quite understand what's going on. But the parallelism in, in Man on the Land between um, as Moira is, is you know, tearing apart the, the tent, she wants out of this, what, a very threatening environment, you know, out of this feminist, what did she call it, this feminist hell? One of them, but, um, but it was interesting that that was, you know, so the violence in that instance is coming from the, the trans woman who feels very vulnerable mm -hmm. in this environment, as opposed mm -hmm. to what we see in the Weimar section where it's all the Nazi, youth attacking uh, the gender variant people that are at the Institute. Right. And it, it's, it's also, you know, in, in a way that is problematic in my view, linking the kind of bacchanalia yeah, yeah. that's happening at the festival where people are, you know, adorned or are in various um, animal or clown or um, dominatrix or whatever, you know, this sort of anything goesness of that mm -hmm. um, also gets amplified in the interiors of the Hirschfeld space, which is about right. you know a, a person with whiskers and you know in a little cat costume and other kinds of um, uh, I don't know theatricality, let's right. say, that makes it seem as though, from my perspective, mm -hmm. that that was a central aspect. Um, of the comparison, so yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's an it's, it's the an violence, odd. it's the it's yeah. the you know the book burning and the yeah. and then juxtaposed with Moira who just wants out, out. and is yep. yeah 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 that was a strange, but I did get the you know the kind of Weimarness of of theatricality and anything goes this kind yes. of uh, I'm playing with gender, okay well let's uh, just shift a little bit don't worry we never shift too much okay. Um, Tra and transparent is not, it's not simply or only about transition and, and trans identity. Um, it's also fundamentally about family. Uh, season one begins with a family dinner. 
Season two began with the stunning uh, family photo set piece. Uh, Man on the Land highlights Moira's uh, time with her daughters. Uh, the implication is, is, has always been that we're watching Moira in the context of her family. Uh, yes, she's doing a brave and lonely thing, but she's still operating inside the context she's always known. Um, the first episode of season three departs from this focus on the family. Um, as we've seen, since the episode follows her, Moira, most entirely on her own. Could you say more about the series' focus on family and why there is this marked departure in season three? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, pe people talk about um, the Pfeffermans as though, and particularly about the three Pfefferman children as though um, they're real, you know, um, in uh, it, 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 saying I hate Josh, you know, yeah. or whatever. Um, and clearly, you know, this is how television works. This is a television family in a big television house um, <laughs> and, you know, a house that's in Pasadena, as you know, um, but, you know, is meant, it's meant to be in, in the Pacific Palisades, but it's, it's TV. This is a, a, about um, how you generate and follow conflict um, mm -hmm. that is largely generational. And it strikes me that, I mean, one of the things about the intended viewership for transparent streaming as it does on Amazon with Amazon Prime mm -hmm. um, is that it's, it's shooting for us, right? It's got us, um, upper middle class people who are over 45. Um, that seems to me to be its audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a limited project. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in order to uh, try to appeal to a you know, relatively, um, I don't know, on either side of that, right? We have these adult children um, who essentially uh, speak to people who are our age and slightly below. Yeah. Um, and so for the identificatory work of TV, for the mm -hmm. um, sort of generic um, foundations, for the visual uh, range, this is family TV. It's from you know, the beginnings right. um, of right. the history of television. So um, yeah. So, well, I was saying to Amy story. before that you know, um, when I started watching Transparent, I mean, I loved it. I, it, was, it resonated, this was a few years ago, and I, I was really, the music and the settings, and I grew up in Pasadena and been gone for a very long time. And, um, and this was supposed to be the Pacific Palisades or downtown LA, but then when you learn that uh, the house, the P Palisades house is actually in Pasadena, I yeah. could see where it was <laughs> speaking to me. Yeah. But also on the, on the, on the intended audience question, um, in fact, a lot of the idea behind this trans series came from my younger daughter, um, who just finished her degree at Madison yeah. <laughs> uh, in sociology, environmental studies, and LGBT studies. And she was telling me about all this fantastic new trans work documentaries and different things. And I said, have you seen Transparent? She said, no. <laughs> right. I, you know, that <laughs> that's for you, Mom. <laughs> that's for, that, that's for right. you. Right. Um, but I also think that you asked about um, why it departs from that focus right. of, on the family in the third season. And it does start to suggest in Man on the Land um, and beyond this, uh, this right. idea of a chosen family and of queer families. And so, um, you know, now we have Maura living with Davina in this, mm -hmm. you know, sprawling um, gingerbread house, which is just another TV house. Exactly. Um, and, and it's a different family. It's her chosen queer family, but, um, but it's a family nonetheless. Yeah, but she quickly sheds, I mean, Allie goes looking for her on yeah. Man on the Land, but yeah. it's, it is this movement away. Yeah. Um, okay, this is, I've written this up and it's kind of long, but bear with me because I love the question and I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to screw it up. So this is why you prepare. So here we go. Okay. Okay. You listening? Yep. All right. Here we go. What do you make of the representation of the lesbian feminist professor, Professor Leslie Mackinac, as you said, played by Cherry Jones and based on the poet Eileen Miles, with whom the director has had an off-screen relationship? For the most part, she's swaggering, blustery, and predatory, but also serves as a character who addresses second wave feminist and social justice concepts like trigger warnings and safe spaces and male privilege. So what is your take on, the, take on this stereotypical representation of the lesbian feminist professor, which you should know something about? <laughs> Some have said that Leslie wields her authority in a traditionally male way and is not a better person for it. Others have said that the show uses Leslie to demonstrate the form of privileged entitlement that comes with climbing the ranks in academia 
and using a position to dazzle, manipulate, and bed younger women. As you mentioned, the specter of upper-class white entitlement hovers over the characters' discussions of male entitlement in, in what really seems to be that what third-wave feminism is exploring and what it needs to accomplish. So I wondered what your take is. And it was, again, just for to full disclosure, when I was talking um, with Amy a little bit about this question, she thought she knew where it was coming from, perhaps my experiences in academia with other um, predatory, predatory lesbians. and, well, not even <laughs> lesbians, right. but other predatory <laughs> types. Um, and, but no, actually, this came, again, from watching with my daughters who said, you know, why are they representing, my, I, my professors, my feminist professors are nothing like that. So I have to admit to being completely seduced by Cherry Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just think that she is huh? an extraordinary screen presence. Oh, she is. And, so, um, and much more compelling than Eileen Miles, um, mm -hmm. who is not a very <laughs> compelling screen presence. Um, so that, that character seems to me to be doing a couple different things. Mm -hmm. One is, um, is commenting on Mort's when Mora was mm -hmm. Mort. Um, Mort's own uh, exploitative behavior um, and his marginalizing of his female colleagues. Maybe you and, could say something in case um, people. So there's a seen. little backstory. Um, the character Mora, who transitions, the the um, character called Mappa, um, who's now the matriarch of the family, used to be a college professor, um, and uh, it, I erroneously thought psychology, but it's actually political I, theory. I, um, so was a political theorist, and we get the revelation uh, later that Mort had um, committed some injustices toward um, his female colleagues and toward the Cherry Jones um, Who tried to get on an editorial board on, right. and applied for 10 years. Yep. And, yes. and was, was not allowed. Was thwarted on. by Mort. Right. Um, so there's this history that is mm -hmm. haunting their relationship, and uh, that gives us some indication that Mort slash Mora um, is a deeply flawed human being, uh, and who had behaved in fairly horrendous ways um, in uh, in professional circumstances. So there's that sort of looming behind that the um, Leslie Mackinac character. But I find um, actually watching Man on the Land again, I, I actually would stick to my sense that it's not all blustering um, sort of male identified behavior, that there's something uh, that's trying to stick to Eileen Miles as a figure after whom uh, this character is modeled. Um, and there's some bluster to Eileen Miles. Mm -hmm. um, she's a strong personality. Again, somebody, you know, when this uh, season was released, people were talking about um, Eileen Miles having a, a sort of a renaissance or a rebirth or a, something. You know, she's been around for 40 years um, it, and been very present in the queer community and has, you know, done a lot of public work. And uh, so her, 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 the whole persona um, is is there in Leslie as well. Um, so, and I also don't think that this is a, a, a program that's really trying to address third wave feminism, despite all the, some of the language that creeps in. I think it's really thinking about second wave feminism and its aftermath, mm -hmm. um, and not really grounding itself very strongly in discourses of today um, in terms of feminism. I don't think that there's much of that there. It's written by 45 year olds um, who are, you know, who aren't steeped in um, campus culture or the life of um, many young women today. Yeah, no, I, I suppose, you know, the, 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 I hear what you're saying about the Leslie Mackinac character and she yeah. is really compelling, but there is this way uh, in in future uh, episodes, which you'll go home and watch, where she seems to be, you know, very manipulative towards her students, mm -hmm. um, and yet, it, in a way, and she's very, um, of course, uh, critical of Mort uh, yeah. when Moyer, wherever, when she was Mort, and your pain and your privilege, and yes. you had the privilege, but she does too. Yeah. So absolutely, no, you're yeah. absolutely yeah. right. So um, I mean, it's, and I wonder for Allie, for the daughter, if there are these two academics that she's right. aspiring to be. Yeah. And she decides to go with Leslie. Yeah. And um, 
and the, then that becomes fraught too. But just interesting, I think. Yeah, it's another dimension of the, these layers where it's, it seems to me that, that Allie's curiosity about her past and the way that she may even be a conduit for the past of her family um, may lead her to a kind of repetition um, in her relationship with Leslie that, um, hmm. you know, it, it's, that's getting into the sort of psychodynamics of these characters. And m many of the psychodynamics are irritating and, um, you know, sort of horrible. As we tried um, to say, though, this is their characters in yes, fiction. So exactly. We can't really hate them. That's right. My last question is, um, and I, you know so much more. I, I, I know it intuitively, but um, you've written so wonderfully about the role of music in the series. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the music for, in all of its various dimensions, both diegetic, non-diegetic, you know, the credits, everything, um, is really important to the series. So what are your thoughts about music in these two episodes? Obviously, the Women's uh, Music Festival has mm -hmm. its own playlist, um, but what about Nina Simone's cover of Don't Nina Leave Me? Pa. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, what, what interested me about, uh, about the music is that it's a, it's a Soloway production. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the music supervisor is her husband or ex-husband, um, but someone she's worked very closely with. Um, and it's another sort of thread of this autobiographical mm -hmm. and really Soloway-driven aspect of this production. Um, so there's a very prominent role given to the music. Josh, the son, yeah. um, is a, a music industry um, figure. So there's a reflexive dimension built into um, thinking about the music industry, thinking about the culture industries um, as you know, indigenous to Los Angeles and as part of uh, the story that, that Soloway is telling about what creation is. Right? And so music is, um, is vital to that undertaking. So sometimes it's identificatory. So the Indigo Girls cameo is, um, you know, was obviously a moment of identificatory, right. um, you know, pleasure for um, for the team. But it also is is reaching out to um, viewers who can stream this music on Amazon. Right. Um, and so you know, she's she's smart uh, about how she's using it. The Nina Simone. Um, uh, song is again contributes to this incredible existential undertaking of this episode, um, mm -hmm. which is really a very complicated, layered meditation on loss, on trauma, on um, uh, you know crisis. Um, what if you have to be your own messiah? Mm -hmm. uh, I've got all these things, and yet, why am I so unhappy? Right. Right. So um, it's it's one of the most poetic, elegiac uh, episodes of the series, it, and it really uh, is using that um, the texture of that song beautifully. Um, don't leave me. Mm -hmm. You spoke too about you know the, also that Josh is in the music industry and the entertainment industry. And the, and the series kind of reflection on Jewish engagement in the entertainment industry in this very self-reflexive way. Do you want to say yeah. a little bit more about that? Well, it's, I'm not sure if I ha if, that I have a ton to say about it other than um, it's, it's both a way to sell more music through Amazon and... Even Jim you know, Croce? It, well, yeah. I, I mean, mean I, I wonder about because it yeah. tries to bring up a really 70s soundscape, yep. which, you know... Got me. What, what, oh, sure. Who's the demographic? Yeah. Okay. That's that's the demographic, right? I mean, so I, the the piece that I started in thinking about transparent, I started thinking about the Jim Croce cover in the first episode, um, and and how soft rock mm -hmm. becomes a signature for our generation, um, and as a way of anchoring a story that. Um, is about the, the birth of these children in the 1970s. Um, and so it, it's also reaching back to television families in the 70s um, mm -hmm. and to uh, the circulation of a certain kind of sound, a certain Southern California um, sort of vibe that is conjured through, um, through soft rock, through bread, through Jim Croce, through 
John Denver, what a, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of range, um, and that becomes an important you know, uh, source material um, for the backstory of the Pfefferman children. Uh, but it also, it, it, it allows the, um, the music supervisor, to, it allows Bruce Gilbert <laughs> to start thinking about ways in which um, we remake music in new idioms. It allows uh, the team to go to queer music Mm -hmm. um, to, so Silas Howard, one of the directors, started in Tribe 8, many of you know, um, and it, there's a whole sort of group of folks also sort of lurking behind mm -hmm. um, in terms of spoken word performance and other lesbian and queer performance cultures that start to feed in. So it becomes this sort of a mixtape of you know, yeah. different moments and different sources that are feeding the various layers of the project. And she's doing that visually um, in ways that are you know, very, very beautiful. I was thinking about the uh, sequence when Maura takes the call from Eliza um, and initially struggles to hear what Eliza is saying on her headset. Mm -hmm. Says, I can't hear you. Can you speak more loudly? And then. The, they raise the volume and clarity of Eliza's voice, and then Soloway starts cutting between her hair, her green hair, out of focus, uh, and the pink earbuds and microphone. Again, you know, so we get this kind of visual poem that is this just incredibly carefully constructed mm -hmm. working of identity from an indistinct voice into finally a full shot of Eliza as she walks outside of the clinic and cries. And so that visually that's happening. She's got such a strong sense mm -hmm. of how to compose those sort of aspects of identity. And I think that she's using music in a similar way, that it becomes this sort of layering mm -hmm. um, that builds character, that builds um, conflict and relation, um, but also builds the past. And also in the theme music, it is very elegiac, yeah. and it comes up every time. And I love, too, that in, in the Elijah episode that, um, if you remember at the beginning, Moira has her pashmina yeah. with the beautiful colors. That's that right. really, and, and she loses and that. And Davina tells her that she looks beautiful, the, and she and, loses it. Yeah. And Davina is wonderful, by the way. Yeah. Um, but when she, you know, she not only loses the pashmina in the clinic, but I suppose that's where she loses her purse and then her shoe in right. some kind of... Just falling apart. Yeah. yeah. Right. Anyways, with that said, thank you everybody for coming. Thanks and join me in thanking Amy oh, Valerejo for Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you all.